Thank you, President Walton. I just want to uh, start out by saying I'm definitely supporting this, and I don't think that's a shocker to anyone since I was standing next to Mayor Breed, uh, Director Carroll, Chief Scott at one of the press conferences where she expressed her frustration with the current state of the tenderloin. I also want to associate my um, comments with those of Supervisor Safai on his insistence that we invest more in absence-based recovery. I think that positive directions is just a start. It's one of the reasons why I had a hearing um, where we heard from the Recovery Summit Working Group. These are people who are suffering from the disease of addiction, who have been involved in the criminal justice system, who sometimes got sober um, through the criminal justice system. And we listened to them for hours and we heard their recommendations on what they thought we should be doing as a city to help people get off the streets. And there was valuable information in that. And what I continue to feel um, as we have these discussions, that there is still profound misunderstanding and lack of, uh, lack of ideas of how to really address those who are suffering um, from addiction. I have mentioned before in many of these hearings that I have personal experience with this. Um, in family, it is something that I know way too much about. And for me, today's vote is a choice as to whether we continue to accept the status quo, where two people die of an overdose per day, per day or try to earnestly address the most serious public health crisis that is facing our city. The stats on this, to me, are just overwhelming. We know that in 2018, 259 people died of an overdose. And then in 2020, that number nearly tripled to 717. And this year, nearly 600 people have died, again, because of a drug overdose. And we know, and this is why it's a crisis, and this is why we're here, that's more than twice the number of COVID deaths we've had in San Francisco since the start of the pandemic. We also know that it could be a lot worse because, of course, we promote the use of Narcan, which we should be doing. And we know that 1,656 overdoses were actually reversed in 2018. And then we know that that number skyrocketed to 4,307 in 2020. And now in the first six months of this year, Narcan has been used 4,200 times that we know of. And I'm sure it's much higher than that. There could be a lot more deaths on the streets if we weren't using Narcan, which to me is tragic. For me also, these numbers are stark indicators that something is deeply flawed in how we are currently addressing the drug addiction and the overdose crisis. Last year, when you look at what we spent, we allocated $1 billion to address homelessness and over $25 million to address mental health crises and drug overdoses. And yet, these twin crises continue to get worse. And so when you look at what the city has done, what are our policies and why is this getting worse? We have significantly broadened who can access shelter and place hotel rooms and temporary housing, good. We've significantly increased our supply of needles for safe drug use saving people's lives, and we've gone to great lengths to support harm reduction approaches to the overdose crisis. However, when it comes to harm reduction, this is not the only thing. I was shocked at the beginning, just before the pandemic, to see billboards put up in the city that said, no overdose, K-N-O-W, overdose. And in those billboards, it said, if you're going to use fentanyl or heroin, don't do it alone. Of course, we don't want people dying. But it also had a picture of people who looked like they were having a great time using either fentanyl or heroin, sending out to me mixed messages that are quite disturbing. So when you are spending money on billboards like this that are encouraging people to use and you're not investing in absence-based recovery, something is very wrong. What do we have to show for everything that I just mentioned? We still have the highest overdose death rates in the country, not to mention a dramatic rise in homicides and shootings, which does come with the drug trade. I also wanna say a lot has been said about what the mayor has been saying and people have been responding and Supervisor Haney says something about how we hear um, that there are no beds and we lack resources, which for me, I don't understand. I think the Chronicle said, the city has been chronically short on treatment beds for the thousands of people who suffer from homelessness addiction and mental illness. Well, that may be true, but actually I believe that we are short on the will to get people into those beds. That is what we're short of. 
that address the real solutions that address addiction. If you go to findtreatment-sf.org, you'll see that right now, according to DPH, there are 66 beds open for substance abuse right now. There are 34 mental health beds open for those suffering from mental health. But that doesn't even tell the full picture because these are just city funded beds. There are beds open all over the place right now as we speak. And the information on fine treatment is not always consistent with what I'm hearing from people who work in treatment centers and who are in treatment. We know that 890 Hay Street, the Walden House, capacity is 115. Today's count, 56. Today, the site shows 249 beds um, with actually 39 openings. So you really can't get even the full story of how many open beds we have. And when I visited Walden House a couple of months ago, because I've been touring all of the facilities that we have under DPH, they certainly weren't at capacity then. And I was told they also hold beds and lease them out to other counties. So what really is the correct information? I know we have 100 openings right now. And yet we know that the Tenderloin streets are lined with people who are suffering from the disease of addiction with their drug dealer right there, ready and willing to sell them their next hit that may result in an overdose. We know that's happening. When I look at this problem and everyone says we have thousands of people living on the streets in the Tenderloin, what I see and what I've walked, I've walked through there many times, we have thousands of people slowly dying on the streets of the Tenderloin. These are people's sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, and it's totally unacceptable. And I get why the Mayor Breed is upset. We know that fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. This drug is different. This is not a party drug. This is not something you come back from. Every expert says it is not like any other drug. It's more addictive and it's more deadly. We just settled two lawsuits arguing this exact point. The people who are dying on our streets, you see them, I saw them the other day when I was in the Tenderloin in that fentanyl fold, passed out in a blackout, barely breathing, are clearly in a position where they cannot make decisions for themselves and they pose an immediate danger to themselves and sometimes others. We have to accept that harm reduction alone is not working and that additional critical intervention resources are necessary if we want to get serious about addressing this crisis for addicts and for those who are living in the Tenderloin. Unfortunately, for those who suffer from addiction, consequences work. Consequences work. And that's what a lot of people, that's how a lot of people are compelled into recovery. I heard someone say in our city government, who I won't name, that we are robbing people of their bottoms. And I honestly think we, in our policies, sometimes are enabling them to their death. I know, obviously, that there's going to be people who disagree with me, but the disease of addiction is not a free license to use on the streets until you kill yourself or seriously harm someone else. The disease of addiction is awful. It's a beast of a disease. It causes people to do things that they don't want to do, that they later on, when they seek recovery, end up making amends to many people for the things that they've done. You don't punish the person for being sick with substance abuse. But when their behavior causes harm to other people, when the alcoholic who can't stop drinking keeps getting behind the wheel of a car, yes, I feel sorry for the person who's suffering from alcoholism. It sucks. But you know what? That person can't get behind the car and kill an entire family of four, which actually happened to my friend growing up. And when you're under the influence of meth and heroin and fentanyl and all of these drugs, it's not pretty. It is not just this person is suffering from this. It is messy. It is awful. It hurts people. It hurts the children in the Tenderloin. This is not just party, 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 like the billboards would have suggested. This is a disease that causes people to do things they don't want to do. It causes 
people to commit crimes they don't want to commit. And it hurts people and we need to intervene and we need to provide consequences and we need to provide ways out for these people. And what else? The people who sell the drugs face no consequences. I read about a mother describing how her daughter's drug dealer was arrested three times each time he was out within days selling to her again. How is this acceptable? I know one case where a dangerous drug dealer with selling with a loaded weapon was sent to drug court for an eventual dismissal. On October 27th, a known tenderloin drug dealer was in court for his preliminary hearing on four counts of felony possession for sale, only to be given diversion with a promise he go to five to 10 NA meetings, Narcotics Anonymous meetings, and then the case will be dismissed. So instead of doing the preliminary hearing on a known drug dealer who was arrested by the police for four felony sale cases, with the police officer there ready to go, the dealer gets diversion and is given five to 10 NA meetings. I don't know if you know, but Narcotics Anonymous is for addicts who have the desire to stop using the drug they're using. Not Drug dealers aren't always suffering from substance abuse. And if you send a drug dealer to Narcotics Anonymous who's not suffering from, they're just, they have more customers. It doesn't make any sense to me. And also, how are they proving to the judge? I'd like to know how, because when I was a DA, they actually had to come back with slips when we had them go to AA or when we had them go to NA meetings. They actually had to prove that they went to these meetings and prove to the judge that they were getting better. The DA's own dashboard shows they haven't tried one drug sales case, showing they're striking favorable with deal, deals like this all the time. Meanwhile, the death toll skyrockets. These dealers are coming in from outside our city, causing harm to us, our neighbors, our children, our families, and they do so with total impunity. It's the ugly truth no one's mentioning. Are we going to simply prosecute or arrest our way out of this? And of course not. No one is saying that. The mayor definitely isn't. But we must enforce the laws that help prevent death and create unbearable living conditions for our children and families. We need a combination of law enforcement and social services. We need a combination of consequences and treatment. This is what has successfully happened in Europe, and it's exactly what our mayor is advocating for. In my opinion, it is the only humane option, given how dire the emergency has become. Notwithstanding the grave issues that people who are addicted to drugs are facing, we have to acknowledge that the epicenter of this crisis is in the Tenderloin, where a significant number of immigrant and refugee families and children work and live. What does it say about our city? And I was very moved when I had my briefing with Director Carroll on what she experienced when she was in the Tenderloin and the stories she heard from families. What does it say? that we find it acceptable for children to walk through the tenderloin where people are dead on the streets from overdose, assaulted day after day when they are on their way to school and work, which is happening, not being dramatic. I mean, what is it going to take for us to say enough is enough? And I think it's this. In September, we know that an 11-year-old girl, my daughter's 12, an 11-year-old girl who wears a hijab was walking a younger sibling to school when they were attacked by someone clearly suffering from mental health issues and was sent to the intensive care unit of the hospital for her injuries. The attacker was arrested for assault, child endangerment, and a hate crime, but the girl said she's seen her around the neighborhood again since the incident, and she's terrified. I, I just don't get it. I don't understand why we aren't doing more, and I'm glad we're doing this. When we talk about public health, we have to think about the whole community, including the children and families that are in the neighborhoods. We have a public health obligation to them too. And right now we're not doing that. The reality is that living in the tender, the reality that folks who are living in the tenderloin, what they face day after day is abhorrent. And I am glad Supervisor Haney is supporting this. And I'm glad that he, with the work that he's been doing, 
We have to try something new, and this emergency declaration is a start. And let's be clear, as people have said over and over again, the mayor and the San Francisco Police Department currently have the authority to enforce drug laws prohibiting drug use and dealing, and this proposal does not provide them with any new power to do that. The proposal before us will allow the city to leverage existing resources to the Tenderloin with the urgency this crisis deserves. It will quickly create centers where those suffering from addiction can receive mental health and other human services. And I know this is gonna be hard because it is very hard to catch the person in that fleeting moment when they've had enough of their disease, when they are willing to get help. But we need to have a place where it's there and we can quickly get them into the services that they need. It will, and I'm hoping, disrupt the deadly open air drug market. It has to stop. And it will expedite cleaning and infrastructure requests. The alternative of others that I've heard and everything I've read seems to be a combination of doing nothing, arguing about what to do, or just doing the same. And one of the ways that people struggling with addiction commonly get access to treatment in San Francisco is through the criminal justice system. Is that the best way for people to get help? No, it's not. But we shouldn't ignore a good and practical approach for an unknown perfect one. Given the awful and increasingly deteriorating situation, I believe we need to try everything. I am actually just dumbfounded that we are facing the situation that we are. And I have to say, I have such profound faith and Director Carroll to lead us through this, given what she's shown us she can do with COVID. I know, and I have, like I said, I have so much faith that she will be able to use the necessary resources, be open and honest with what she's doing, report back to us and make a difference because we no longer have the option to do nothing. So I have no questions. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to vote yes. And I want to thank you, Director Carroll, for what you put up with and for what you um, are going to embark on. Because, like I said, I have full faith that you are going to be able to make a difference. And I am here to support. Thank you.